So this is going to be an example of super impromptu. So okay. all fault of my own, and no fault of anybody else, my staff, I didn't know I was doing this beat. <laughs> so first, uh, I guess I could do a little, a little bit about myself. Does anybody know who I am before I start speaking? OK. That's probably not an ego, but two people, no problem. Right? Um, I'm a serial entrepreneur. Uh, I have a background in investment, finance, valuation, real estate. Uh, I used to buy real estate in downtown Brooklyn. I had a dot com. Uh, after the, I started in 2000, right about the time we had the credit um, bubble and gentrification took over Brooklyn. So we had strong fundamental values plus a bubble. So we rolled the wave up. And then about 2006, second half of 2006, I sold off everything because um, I realized that two plus two doesn't equal 196. <laughs> okay. And I'm not even good at math, but you know, I figured there was something wrong there. Um, after I sold everything off, I decided I want to short everybody who did business with me. Uh, does anybody know why? <laughs> Tell me why. You're betting on it going down. Because two plus two doesn't equal 196. <laughs> so I figure at 196, I have at least 40 points to go. I didn't know what two plus two equal, but I knew it's south of 196. So um, the key was to open up a hedge fund, get access to all that leverage that everybody had in Wall Street and write it down. Um, I didn't have a lot of hedge fund uh, entrepreneurs who sounded, looked, or acted like me, so it was a little difficult. And even though I got the papers formed, at that time, the market started to crack because they realized what? Two plus two doesn't equal 196. That should be easy by now, right? <laughs> two plus two doesn't equal 196. So the hedge fund um, entrepreneurs who did the best got the most redemptions because everybody wanted to pull money out cover their Miami condos and MBS, et cetera, which is a perverse incentive. So the better I do, the more money it's taken away from me. So I said, this is not a good time for a hedge fund. But at the same time, at that time, you couldn't market hedge funds. So I decided to show everybody how smart I was, or at least how smart I thought I was. So since I couldn't market the hedge fund directly, which I never even got started, I decided to market myself because I didn't go to Harvard Business School and I wasn't uh, on a Goldman Sachs prop test. So I started a blog and I would write my opinions. So I'd say, obviously, the residential real estate market was just the overpriced. It's going to crash. Just all the home buildings, builds, but the commercial real estate market was overpriced as well. And that's going to crash. And there were a few naysayers, you know, all the yeah, triple, double A credit ratings and this and that. So I called the collapse of General Gold Properties at the time, the second largest real in the country. I said, Bear yeah, Stearns was insolvent. Lehman Brothers was insolvent. Washington Mutual. Countrywide, etc. The banks started dropping like flies every three to six months. And what I would do to monetize it, I would buy out of the money puts. Basically, contracts that would gain in value if prices fell. And since everybody thought, well, we have investment grade ratings, all the rating agencies said this is good, and the analysts have a buy on everything, I was buying puts on Bear Stearns at 25, seven, 25 cents a contract. Um, they were way out of the money at about five or ten dollars. Bear Stearns was trading, I think, at 90, 60, 130 something. When Bear Stearns would crack, those 25 cent put contracts went up in price. Okay, how much do you think they went up to? Five bucks. Five bucks. That would be a pretty good deal. They yeah. bought five bucks. Anybody else? Two, three. How much? One hundred dollars. Eighty-six dollars. So for every 25 cents I put out, I got back eighty-six dollars. So you know I. Um, I went to my mother-in-law's house to pick up my kids at the time. Um, I looked at my phone and my account had all these extra zeros. <laughs> I mean, like literally, like way over here. And I said, damn, Windows phone is all buggy. So I kept rebooting the phone. Every time I rebooted it, there was another digit to it. And then the news popped up. Bear Stearns, I'm like, ah, okay, finally. So we had, you know, Bear Stearns, you had Lehman, um, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that was the start of my career in fundamental analysis on the bear side. Uh, a few of the media concerns caught on through Google uh, introducing Reggie Miller to video, you see a little scissor reel. And it's basically the same analysis with a search of replace of the names. We're actually exactly, uh, we're there again right now. Roughly 10 years later, 11 years later, going on 12 years, wow. Um, the exact same scenario. Slightly different, banks are better capitalized, but everybody's pretending that things are not wrong. So, back then, it was 
the way I monetized it was direct shorts or puts. Now I'm monetizing it by using blockchain technology and creating a peer-to-peer -peer capital markets. Typical pet capital markets are, can you hear me? Yes. You have uh, Central, the Central Bank. Around the Central Bank, you have money center banks, the guys who own the Central Bank, literally, if you don't know the banking system. The Central Bank is not a government entity, it's a private corporation owned by 12 shareholders. Money center banks, JP Morgan, Citibank, etc. Around them, you have national exchanges, uh, national banks, regional banks, all in concentric circles. And so value when it travels goes from the middle out to the outer circle and back. With the outer, outermost circle being mom and pops and regular people and you know, retail investors, etc. Very inefficient. Every time you pierce the circle, what happens? Someone has their hand out. Okay? A lot of circles. So you go out the circle to the regular person and you have a half dozen to two dozen hands, then back into the circle with more hands. Okay, so it's very inefficient, unless you're a banker, then it's super efficient. Okay, you know, boom is cool heaven. So with a peer-to-peer -peer capital market system, what would it look like? You don't seem like I just feel proud. One to one, but what would one to one look like with, you know, millions of people in it? Yeah, with dot here, dot there, dot there, dot there, dots everywhere, each dot has a dot, a line connecting. There is no dot that is not available to another dot anywhere in the system. So now you have a direct connection. You have zero hands or one with itsy bitsy hand collecting the transfer value versus all these hands for each specific circle going back and forth. It's actually safer, more efficient, cheaper, and faster. Uh, despite the fact you can use a very slow system like Bitcoin with, let's say, a 35-minute confirmation time or a two-hour confirmation time. And that sounds like a long time until you think about how long it takes to settle a stock trade. Two days versus two hours, which is more efficient. Okay, and Bitcoin is seldom two hours, but even if it took six hours, it's still more efficient. Plus, you have a built-in audit trail, et cetera, et cetera. So, we started on the Bitcoin blockchain. I built a digital swap system. We moved over to Ethereum, and we have what we call the beta. It stands for Veritasium Autonomous uh, Distributed Interactive Research. So we took the research, our research team, currently six analysts and a manager, and they do research day in and day out, basically how things work, how much they're worth, et cetera. They come, they come up with a research subject, thesis, et cetera, and then it's applied to the digital network. Right now, we're working on tokenizing almost everything. Okay, as a matter of fact, I'm on my way to the plane right now. We're going to Nigeria tonight. And I have, uh, I have uh, joint ventures on the African continent and deals. And one of the things that we tokenize is one of the oldest forms of money that's still used, which is what? Gold. gold. Does anybody know about gold yet? He does. Who knows about gold? Come talk to me. Come on, come put you on the spot. He has a fancy gold watch. <laughs> no, that's not gold. It's not gold? It's gold color. It's gold color? <laughs> well, gold is gold color. So what do you know about gold? I mean, you know, been used as a form of money since the dawn of time, really. Up and down. Um, it was uh, it was a standard. We were on a gold call. We were on a gold standard for a while until uh, well, many many downturns. But officially, I guess in 1913, when, when the Fed took us off, gold was confiscated. Um, right now, the Fed holds a lot of gold, and a lot of people know that. Um, I like gold as, as, as a form of money. Um, if you look at it through its history, it's it's, it's held its value, um, and it's continued to. Um, well, it's continued to, to function as money, uh, to be a store of value mainly today. People hold it. You can't necessarily use it as money. Um, because Why not? It's very, well, it's very, it's, it's, it's difficult to transact with. Why? That's one of the, because if you have a gold coin, let's say you have a, let's say you have an American gold eagle, you can't buy, uh, you can't buy local bread with it. You Why? can't go into, well, Why because, can't? because <clears throat> it's worth maybe, you know, however much money it is, which coin, which coin you have, if you can buy local bread for $2, a, a piece of gold for two dollars is is minuscule, yes. so it's very difficult to transact with, which has been exploited by the Federal Reserve over time. Like that, yeah, but that's that's worth a lot more than uh, a loaf of. So right. that means that this would be inefficient money. Okay, yeah. as long as you promise to give them all back, I'll let you see them. <laughs> <laughs> yes.